Hello and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 17. Joining me today is the author of Natalie Tan's book of luck and fortune, a book that one reviewer on Fresh Fiction notes is a smashing debut that will leave readers hungry for more, which is true both metaphorically and literally. And I will link to that review in the episode description. As well as this, there is the forthcoming Vanessa Yu's Magical Paris Tea Shop, which will be out on the 4th of August. Without further monologuing from me, welcome Roselle Lim. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? Right now during quarantine, it's a little bit dicey mental health wise in that I've already lived through one somewhat of a similar outbreak or pandemic because I was in Toronto during the SARS outbreak in 2003. Hmm. So the experience is a little bit similar in that there was a lot of obviously racial backlash against Chinese people then and you see it now as well against Asians and that's carried over. The main difference is that the lockdown, having to stay inside and not really be able to go out. For me, the way it affects me the most is I'm a creature who needs food for comfort Hmm. and having to resort to just only making my food it makes it a little bit difficult in that i live in the country and it's hard for me to get to the nearest asian grocery store to get all of my ingredients anyway so there's a lot of food that i've been going without that's driving me somewhat nuts (laughs) i can relate to that i'm stuck to getting grocery deliveries so whatever's from that one shop i get got a big list of places i'm going to when it's over I can't remember if it was you who added me or if I added you, but one of us added the other on Twitter and I followed your journey from hopeful novelist to published author. Can you tell us more about your writing background? English isn't my first language. English is actually my third. I was born in the Philippines and my family's ethnically Chinese, but I also have Filipino cultural background. The Hmm. dialect we spoke of Chinese is Fuchen, Hokkien. I also speak Tagalog which is the native language of the Philippines, and of course, English. So when I came to Canada, I had to learn French on top of that. (laughs) (laughs) I've always loved stories. My grandmother in the Philippines, she buy these comics or these novels, and she's constantly reading all the time. And we'd watch Filipino shows and stuff all the time. And she would read to me or tell me, native folklore, mythology, all of that, just constantly stories and stories. And learning about that instills this desire in you to eventually write and make your own. That's lovely to hear. Your first book, Natalie Tan's Book of Luck and Fortune, is about a woman whose name listeners might well be able to guess. She's returned home after her mother's death. She's been away for some time. She wanted to study cooking, which her mother was against. And in returning she finds her neighbourhood community very changed. It's essentially threatened by the real estate industry. And to keep this brief, she starts to consider reopening her grandmother's restaurant, which has been considered a jewel and crucial to the area. So, Roselle, although you've got these different themes of the sadness and Natalie's growth, it's very nice, it's quite magical. And then I got to about 50% of the way through the book, and I thought, hang on a minute, is this book one big metaphor? In what way? curious to hear what you think oh that's uh, you're turning that on me oh so it goes from magical realism and you think no this is full-on fantasy I just wondered if there was a big theme that kind of pulled it together that's maybe under the surface of what you've written part of it is the kind of the immigrant generations that come after what their pattern is it kind of mimics the mother-daughter relationships when you're an immigrant you come into your new country you tend to want to assimilate Mm. And the second generation is given that message of wanting to assimilate. So they end up, I wouldn't say disowning their culture, but like putting it more on, I guess, a back burner. And because their parents are always telling them speak English when you're at home, that kind of thing. And then when you have the generation that comes after that, there is a big movement into rediscovering your roots and your cultural roots for what was missed in the previous generation. Mm. So that's the theme that I have in there. The other themes that I have is mental illness in that in definitely in my culture, there's still a lot of stigma around it and getting help. 
in identifying it. And I wanted to show that Miranda, having suffered from anxiety and depression and agoraphobia, that she could be a good mother, even though she's suffering from these things. Mm. On this subject, talking of different metaphors here, you have metaphors everywhere in the book, literary metaphors almost. The one I most remember is the idea of tears as tiny crystals collected in a bowl. You have a particular love, a joy in words. For me, the tears turning into crystals are, it's something that I think is relevant in that when you have sorrow, especially such a deep sorrow, it never really goes away. And there's always, as it is in your head, in your memories, that it's there, it lingers. I think that it's just a logical conclusion to have a physical manifestation of that. I saw it and I I liked it as a description, but that's been very interesting to hear, definitely. Tell us about your main character, Natalie. Was she always planned to be unsure of herself? Yes, definitely. Because of her upbringing, Natalie had a very difficult childhood in that she had to deal with her mother having these issues and feeling just isolated. Like she had to be somewhat of a caretaker for her mother. And that burden on a child shapes you and gives you a lot of hang-ups. And some of these hang-ups are commitment issues, just also having that chip on your shoulder when you see the people. That's why she views her neighbors with animosity and that she felt that they never helped her. Mm. You've introduced the mother's mental illness and obviously we've got the relationship there. May I ask, how did your relationship with your own mother influence the novel? It was me. It's not so much that my relationship with my mother, this is my relationship with my daughter. I've always been very transparent that I suffer from anxiety and depression. The only thing that I don't have is obviously the agoraphobia that Miranda suffers. But I wanted to prove this and that I have a daughter and I wanted her to see that even though, yes, her mother suffers from bouts of sadness that is deeper than the regular kind that she experiences, that it doesn't detract from my love for her or it shouldn't detract from the quality of our relationship. That is lovely. I thought, oh, you know, it's, there's an influence with your mother's relationship with you there, but I'm going to see the novel in a new light. So you said you're into, you know, your food and that's kind of obvious with the book. What's your favorite meal to make? I'm just thinking what I would consider comfort food. In the winter months, I would have to go with congee, which is like a a rice. I guess I would call it like a rice pudding. Mm. It's very filling. What you do is you put rice in a pot and you put in a little amount of rice, but a lot of water and it thickens up into this kind of like a pudding. And you have different toppings for it, whether it be pickled cabbages or you can even use kimchi or pork floss or just century eggs, different types of stuff you can put on top. And if Mm -hmm. I happen to be lucky and have access to an Asian grocery store, I would get one of those. I don't know if you've ever seen the long donuts. They're like oil sticks is what they're called. It's a donut, but it's like a stick. And it's yes. quite good. And you can dip that into the kanji and eat it. No, it sounds good. Obviously, this book deals with meals that are magical almost. But have you had an experience yourself of food helping or even solving a problem? In my family, if anybody is feuding with anybody else or having an argument with them and they haven't spoken in a while, one of the easiest ways to try to break that silence is to have a peace offering of food. Would you like to have a meal with me? You know what I mean? Or do you want to just sit down and eat? And that would be one of the first steps towards dialogue. I think that sounds brilliant. A really good way of sorting things out. On the subject of magic still, did you ever worry that readers might not buy into the concept of the magic? I think it's because if you've never read anything that is fabulous or in the realms of magical realism, it would be a little strange for the reader. Because Mm. magical realism is the type of ordinary magic that I would almost say you take for granted. Things that you see in everyday life that you don't really think twice about how beautiful it is. Where in high fantasy or even just in the fantasy genre, it's meant to stand apart. You're meant to see it as standing apart from normal everyday goings. 
So for some people, they don't understand it. They're like, I don't get a lot of it. But for me, it's very much cultural in that in my culture, there's a lot of superstitions, silly superstitions, everything, you name it. And it works so well with how this magical realism operates. One example is that my mother would tell me if I wanted to get taller, all I had to do was just jump up and down and that should solve it, that I should be (laughs) taller. Or she would say, oh, you're making a really ugly face. You shouldn't make an ugly face because a bad wind will come by and just sweep across your face and just permanently stick it there. Little things like that. Or don't sleep with your feet facing the window or a ghost or a spirit's going to come by, pull you by the toes, pull you out that window and just like gobble you up. Things like that, that it's just when you're being told this kind of stuff, you have to somewhat believe that interesting things happen on a daily basis. I can relate to um, the wind will change and you'll stay like that. That's the phrase I've often heard. What was behind the decision to incorporate recipes into the narrative? Those are my father's recipes. Every single one of them. My dad was a cook in the family. My mom made some soups, but it's mostly my dad. And when he and my mother were working full time, long hours, I would be the one at home. My father would leave a note on the fridge that would say, "Okay, I'm making this for dinner. Can you take this out of the freezer in the morning? And then when you get home, prepare it so that I basically be his sous chef. So by the time he comes home, everything would be ready for him to just cook. And when he transcribed this, I asked him, I said, Daddy, can I have your recipes? And he's like, okay. He wrote it all down and he emailed it to me. Of course, I was looking at it and I made sure that I tried making it at home. The reason why there's no quantities, it's because they didn't turn out the way that he made it. I don't know what he's missing or if it's a matter of just the cook's magic. Like, There's got to be a cook in anybody's family where they would make something and they're not even using measurements. They're just going by gut or going by instinct and it always tastes wonderful. And then when you try to get them to stop and write the stuff down so you can recreate it, it just never tastes the same. Mm. On the subject of making food, I haven't researched it, so maybe I'm completely out of the loop here. But there's a moment that Natalie is chopping onions and she starts, I think it's chewing mint gum which will help with the whole uh, phenomenon of the tears. Is this a real thing? You know, should we be doing this? I Googled it. I really Uh. Googled it. The thing is, I've heard it from somebody, a friend of mine, and they're like, oh, yeah, you do this. And I'm like, huh. And then I went on Google and I'm like, does this really happen? And apparently some people really do do that. Chewing gum while you're chopping onions. So we've got this real estate agent who comes in to the neighbourhood that Natalie has moved back into. She wants to be the middleman, get people's different buildings sold. Was this thread of outsiders trying to essentially disrupt for their own gain based on a particular event? It's gentrification that's just happening everywhere, especially Mm -hmm. in North America, where you take a neighbourhood that has a multicultural makeup to it and they end up pricing them out or raising the rent so that they can move the people out. And then it turns into more of an upscale, more like white neighborhoods with yoga studios and pottery barn, that kind of a thing where you lose the people, the marginalized people that live there. I guess it's increasing real estate prices as well as as a part of it. Mm -hmm. The location you use is San Francisco's Chinatown. Can you tell us, introduce us to this Chinatown? I chose San Francisco's Chinatown because it is the oldest Chinatown in North America. I didn't want to choose the one in Toronto because Toronto did not have the Paifang, the gate. Yes. It's missing the gate. Montreal has one. Mississauga has one. I have been there once when I was a child to San Francisco. And I figured that is the best place to set this book. And another interesting fact is that I lived or was born in the Chinatown in the Philippines, which is the oldest Chinatown in the world, the one in Manila. I will have to look up Manila's Chinatown as well. I obviously had a picture in my head of London's Chinatown, which I quickly discovered wasn't big enough to work as any kind of image in the book. I haven't been there. I went to London in August, but we stayed mostly in the Westminster area. 
where Big Ben was still sadly under saran wrap. I'm not sure if they're done the renovations yet. I'm not sure, actually. I think they've done some of them. Obviously, the news isn't much about Big Ben at the moment, although it was. A different subject again. Natalie loves classical music. Do you love classical music? It's very soothing. I'm eclectic in my musical taste. I like listening to it. I had to put music in the book as kind of one of the themes in there because one of the biggest effects that music has on people is that it could soothe them. It could be a balm, a comfort. This is what the main character, Natalie, and even Miranda found. This was their love. This helped them and soothed them and even eventually, as you find out, that Miranda fell in love with a musician. It's part of their makeup, it's part of their DNA that they would be drawn to music. That bit was actually quite surprising. And I loved how you resolved it, which was lovely. And then the romance. We should probably talk about the romance in the book, the main one. The romance between Natalie and Daniel. It's very much in its early stages in the book. Was this an element of the book that was always going to be in there? I've always had the romance in as it wasn't the biggest emphasis because to me the book is really all about Natalie's journey and her and what she wanted. Daniel was basically a bit of the icing on the cake. Mm. I understand some of the readers are very disappointed that, you know, the romance is not big enough. There isn't a lot of it, but the main reason is that what I've written is not a romance. It is basically general fiction or what you consider women's fiction, where the focus really is on the main character and her journey. Mm. You're saying about the relationship not being the biggest part. I sat down, I thought, okay, so I've read books with characters that are chefs and things before. And I really appreciated that the restaurant isn't actually the main factor in Natalie's journey. I don't think I have a question there as such, but uh, I just wanted to point that out. It's very nice that you've got the thoughts and the progression of Natalie's healing. And then the restaurant comes at the end and we see the why and the how rather than the actual resolution as such. You have obviously talked a bit about the culture in the book. Can we uh, kind of hone into the idea of the filial piety? You've got Natalie's regrets about her mum and everything. How much was this in your mind when you were writing? Filial piety, I know I've, to some extent, I have disappointed my own parents that I've decided to choose this instead of accounting or law or medicine. Mm. It's an Asian thing, right? They want you to be successful. And those are typically the more successful professions. Natalie wanted to be a cook and her mother said no. And the main reason her mother said no is because Miranda did not want that for herself. So she wrongfully assumed that just because she didn't want it for herself that her daughter would not want that. Because her own mother, Chow, wanted her to take over. It mimics that cycle that I spoke about earlier about, you know, immigrants and wanting to change and then going back to your roots, that kind of thing. Because if you see Chow, she's the immigrant, the grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. She wanted to cook. And then her daughter wanted nothing to do with it. Assimilation, that kind of thing. And then you look at Natalie, who wants to rediscover her roots and follow what her grandmother did. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking on the one book. It's the book that's out, but there is another book on the horizon. So your next book is out on the 4th of August, as said, and it's Vanessa Yu's Magical Paris Tea Shop. And am I right in thinking that this Vanessa Yu is Miss Yu from Natalie Tan? Evelyn. It's Evelyn's niece. Evelyn, the fortune teller from Natalie Tan. It's her niece and her family of clairvoyance. So tell us more about the book. I thought up of the book. This was a unicorn of a book in that it wasn't that difficult to write. It wasn't that difficult to edit. The biggest hurdle that I had with this book was going to Paris to make sure that I saw everything, took everything in, tasted everything. Because when I was in talks with the first book, one of the editors that I was speaking to and my agent both suggested that I use part of my book advance to go see Paris. It's a city I've always wanted to visit. And last August, I finally got that figured out. I wasn't sure what was going on with Brexit because we were planning to do Paris for one week and then London the next week. 
we were originally going in April because Paris in the springtime, yes, that's what everybody thinks about. But unfortunately, that was also close to where the Brexit decision was and we weren't sure what you, what your government was doing. Uh, no, no one's sure. Yeah. <laughs> we pushed it all the way back to August. When I finally went, it was... It was everything that I've always dreamed of because ever since I was a child, I wanted to go to Paris because of the art and then the food. They're probably on the same level, but I wanted to go. So when I went, we stayed near Saint-Germain-du-Pré and I visited every single site that was in the book, the Medici Fountain, Musée d'Orsay, Eiffel Tower, Versailles, Monet's house and garden in Givenchy. That was lovely going out of the city to take a train and then just seeing the village and the house that Monet was in and the famous water lily ponds Mm -hmm. and I had to do all of these things because this is how I write I have to be there I have to see smell taste touch all of those it's part of my method because I consider myself a sensory writer I want my readers to be able to experience everything and to see the book in a cinematic way when they're reading. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I had to go to Paris. It was just absolutely lovely. The only thing that was not lovely was the fact that I had planned the flight the night before so that we would sleep on the plane. And by the time it was morning, we should be able to have been rested and be walking around Paris, no problem. But my child had other plans and she would not let me sleep. And it was not pretty the next day when we went. I was going to say, did you get any writing done in Paris? Did you write any of the book there? I didn't. I didn't get any writing done. I only took down a lot of notes, just setting notes. Hmm. She, Natalie knew, my child knew that this was going to be a trip that mommy needed. So we hit up all of the museums. The poor child was bored in some of them but I was like taking the culture taking the culture so she's looking at everything and I had to see all the paintings I didn't get to see or linger in front of the paintings that I wanted to linger because if it was just me and my husband I would tell him hey I need at least a solid half hour to stand in front of this thing and look at it you could do whatever you want go take her whatever but that didn't happen because as children go young children go she's like I'm done. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, move on. (laughs) I haven't got children myself, but I went with my mum and my nephew to Osborne House, Queen Victoria's house on the Isle of Wight here. And I was really, really looking forward to showing him this place that I'd been to before and loved. And we just ended up going through it very, very quickly. So, (laughs) Yes, that is a disappointment. But I did do things for her in in London because we did the Harry Potter studio tour for her Mm -hmm. which she loved and I can't remember what the name of the toy store was the one that was multi-floor that had a bear Hamleys yes Hamleys we took her to that that she enjoyed and the Harry Potter she enjoyed unfortunately my North American child I said this is your day we get to do Harry Potter we get to go to Hamleys what would you like to eat she looks me square in the eye and says Pizza Hut (laughs) I'm like, we flew your butt eight, nine hours to get to Europe. And what you want to eat is Pizza Hut. (laughs) And she's like, yes, mommy, that's what I would like for lunch. So we had Pizza Hut, which is an experience compared to the Pizza Hut that I'm used to here. And then afterwards for dinner, we were walking along the South Bank, which is absolutely lovely. Mm. And I asked her, what would you like for dinner? She looks at me and she goes, hot dogs. I just find it really comical that me being such a foodie that my child would say, I kind of miss home. I need to have pizza and hot dogs, knowing that we were going to be leaving in like two days. I'm thinking, I I suppose you could like take her to Harrods or something. Oh, we did. We went. We actually went because it was our modus operandi to take a cab or a black taxi to the tourist attraction and then walk all the way back however long it took to get to the hotel. So after having gone to the Natural History Museum, we were walking all the way back to where our hotel was and we went through High Park, Mm -hmm. that area, and I saw a sign that said Herod's that way. I said, let's go, let's go take a look and see. And we went and 
I'm like, okay, why don't we do high tea? Because I don't know when I'm going to be back in London, whenever. And I understand it's pricey, but let's do this. It's a foodie experience. So we sat down and we had the high tea, which was quite good, quite lovely. It's huge. I didn't realize how big Harrods was. Mm. It took us 10 minutes just to try to find where the high tea was. <laughs> you said that your relationship with your daughter influenced the book. Sorry, listeners, we're back to the first book. Did you ever wonder about a different name for the character? No, it was meant to be for her. It was always meant to be for Natalie. And she's asked me if she could read it. And I said, if you want to, there isn't anything in there that I can't explain to you. Or if you need any further uh, clarification, I'm here. I don't think she's read it, though. She just picked up her key, Jackson, and went on her merry little way. (laughs) We're going forward again to the 4th of August book. You have a reading from Vanessa Wu's Magical Paris Tea Shop for us. This reading is close to the midpoint of the book, and it covers the start of her clairvoyancy lessons with her aunt. Ma said I was a good girl until forced to do something I didn't want to do. Aunt Evelyn had learned this when she had tried to coax me to drink tea as a child. I'd already had a habit of blurting this predictions and knew what drinking tea would cause. She coaxed, cajoled, and then commanded. I defied her with every molecule of my being. I felt the same now. Rebellion bubbled close to the surface like a simmering broth. This cursed gift both fed and fueled my defiance. With childish logic, I had held my aunt responsible. It was unfair then, and it was unfair now. She shouldn't have borne the brunt of my frustration years ago, nor should she be its target. I'll be better with my attitude, I said. Aunt Evelyn transferred a chocolate eclair onto my plate. I understand it's hard for you. Right now, you don't have any control. Mastering your gift will open the possibilities. Did you ever see anything involving your life, I asked. No. Aunt Charlotte never did either. I wish I had visions of my future. I'm like everyone else. There's a few things I'd like to change in my personal history. I doubted she'd tell me if I asked. The disclosure of regrets was reserved for those who had earned it. I was beginning to think I might never. She continued, It's not possible to see our own path. Imagine how easily we could interfere and abuse our gifts. You'll learn the limitations have a specific purpose to protect us. There has to be room for negotiation. There must be, I reasoned. Of course you'd resort to that tactic. After all, who else taught you better than your aunties? I couldn't help but laugh. Bargaining was an Olympic sport among the aunties and was further divided into two subcategories, hunting and negotiating. Auntie Gloria once stalked online auctions and local flea markets for a year to find a rare Starship Enterprise cookie jar. The haggling left the seller in tears. Auntie Gloria didn't have a cookie jar collection, nor did she care about the sci-fi television series. But Auntie Ning did, and she in turn was holding a decommissioned Ladro figurine hostage. As far as I knew, no items had exchanged hands because the negotiations were still ongoing. Do you know when I discovered my gift, my aunt asked. I shook my head and nibbled on the eclair with the fluffy chocolate hazelnut buttercream filling. I was five. My piano teacher and I were having tea. I saw a vision of her getting married. Miss Hartnell was quite amused when I told her. Months later, but she did walk down the aisle. She thanked me. I still remember what she said. The future is the hardest creature to see. It hides and deceives with its promises of blessings and disaster. When you shared your gift with me, you gave me the clarity I needed. For centuries, the women in our family used our gift to see a line of passive observers who herald future and cataclysm. You must internalize the core principles of fortune telling before you can begin to control your visions. And they are, I asked. She held up a fist and uncurled a finger with each successive tenant. One, all predictions are true descriptions of the future's current course. Two, you cannot compel a prophecy. Three, a fortune teller cannot see her own future. Four, Creating false predictions has dire consequences. 5. A fortune teller does not have a red thread. I could see the twisted logic behind the rules. If a seer could compel a prophecy regarding her own future, she could act to avoid it. 
which would violate the first rule. A prohibition against false predictions ensured allegiance to the truth. And the fifth rule was cosmic balance, as Aunt Evelyn had said. Where do we go from here, I asked. Are there essays I need to write or books I need to read? This isn't one of your college courses. It's all practical application. Everything I know, I learned through the trials and errors of those before us. There isn't a handbook to study. What I'm going to teach you is how to listen to your gift and maximize it. My aunt helped herself to another serving of milfoy and unloaded another slice on my plate. I felt I was in Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. Instead of muscles and bones, though, my study was prophecy. It was impossible to know how many students had passed the course or whether I would too. Where do we start, I asked. Practice. She paused to pour herself more tea. Your fortune telling is erratic. I suspect there's a backlog of prophecies you need to purge. The first step is to submit to the process. I winced, but I had promised to comply with whatever form of torture she had in mind. After all, my aunt had been transparent about how difficult this would be. When you start helping me in the tea shop tomorrow, you will be responsible for sampling tea with the customers. The tea will compel a prophecy, I said. Isn't that breaking the second rule? In this case, no. We need to eradicate the stockpile. It's not compelling when you're running a surplus. How much of one will find out? Tomorrow I'll be barraging strangers with predictions I didn't want to dispense for which they hadn't asked. All the traumatic memories of my past rose to the surface. Mrs. Ferguson's accusing and horrified glare, a broken Cynthia at her wedding, the tears in Dad's eyes, and Mark's face holding an expression I could only call a cocktail of shame, shock, and betrayal. She studied my face. Don't look so deflated. I forced my mouth into a toothy smile. I'm ready to learn, even if it kills me. She laughed. Good. You'll need that attitude. I spoke from the heart. I was done running from my problems and resenting my helplessness. In time and with dedication, I could be like my aunt, living a normal life, being respected by others, and making predictions with confidence. With my aunt's help, I too would master my destiny. To me, this narrative sounds quite different to you know, Natalie Tan. Is it fair to say that this is quite a different book? It is a different book because it's a different main character in that Natalie has a lot of mental baggage from her childhood. Mm. There's abandonment issues. There's a lot that she has that makes the book heavier. It shapes the way she sees the world. With Vanessa, Vanessa grew up quite in a large, a very large loving family. The only thing in her life that she's grappled with is this gift of clairvoyancy that she didn't want. I do like how you've got that extra voice there of the different people in Vanessa's life. Literally, are you writing your next book? I am. I have a two book deal, which is great that I get to write two more books. And the next one is called Sophie's Lonely Hearts Club. And it's about a matchmaker who returns home and takes on matchmaking seven old, grumpy bachelors. That sounds good. Natalie Tan has been optioned for a TV show. Yes, and I am so grateful. The screenwriter who is adapting into the screen is Michael Golamko, and he worked on Always Be My Maybe on Netflix. Hmm. And I am extremely excited to say that I have read the script for the pilot, and it's amazing. That's very good. Any sort of tentative date? There isn't a date yet. Everything is still a, you can't really say anything. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's like publishing. Hollywood is just as similar to publishing in that you have to be given permission when to disclose certain details and such, and you have to be given the green light. And no, there hasn't been many green lights given. Well, it's very exciting, and listeners, look out for it. So, Natalie Tan's book of luck and fortune is out now from Berkeley in the US and one more chapter in the UK. Vanessa Yu's Magical Paris Tea Shop is out on the 4th of August. You will probably remember this now, listeners, because I've said it so often. Roselle, it's been brilliant having you here, and I've loved hearing about London and hearing about Paris and everything about Natalie Tan, because I really did enjoy all the little bits that make this book what it is. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. Hi, listeners. June has had five Mondays, so there's a bit of a gap 
between this and the next episode. Join me on Monday the 13th of July when I will be talking to an as yet to be confirmed author. As always, as soon as the author is confirmed, you'll find the notice on my blog. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 17, was recorded on the 9th of June and published on the 22nd of June, 2020. Music and production by Charlie Place.